mana jorora una mongwe. Amutele le mapensi bana bano ngobe taba mama terele. Kamu le kamu bama bana bano mubainda. Aba gaga bala gata mata bara diba wenda. Iga langu kujua kujua mala la jindi zaram papa na bano bama mutele le. Kamu le kamu le mende. Iba na bano lira pira. Aga gaba mama kujua di mwa bombe. Aya mangandia. Imanozi bama gaga chacha rino aura bana bago babu rambo baje chay. Aga gaba kuire. Kolanga bana bago bende 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 gaga baba baya jembera gaga. Abura kuinda kuchere la guli la wabo. Ibere mo bara bere gai. Kolanga gaga bara bere gai mo umi na bara unka kuse boy. Imiri mo bara bere gai. Kolanga gaga baba mama ringo ba ura bana bago. Pamani yaga gama kongo reba njirai Pamula jagu jitaka mbo Pamula baba mbiri la kumbere mirimo Yuko timari ya hure Aya masese Kujina chobanji ya mungo mbana bago Igoro bana kugorota Aga gaba mana jembe na bana bago Bapengai poranga gulirae Mirimo baba gaga mirimo yeba Ma mirimo yeba ma mirimo yeba Tuta vikiri manu guli baba batu vere shai Aso ya chawa muga beni muna mpundi wa sivu yu jika garu saka mbo yi vete Nga tuwa shiko ya kwenda Iku vere gira pere gira ancho mwe bama tu gore He bama tu habane tuwa mbo Ayo yu weta gambo Kwa mana bama tu pange muse so kute kwa tu zuma nane kwenda kumbire Tu sumpure jisi jesu Aga gana jivinga bama kutere Thanks, Pilato. That was amazing. So, Pilato, you want me to kick off? Okay, I'll go ahead. So, um, Pilato, it's so great to be with you today and to be with folks from around the world who care about inequality and who like good music and who know how to how to bring change. So it's really wonderful to be with all of you. Um, my name is Ben Phillips, and I've been working in the fight against inequality for a long time now, and um, been involved in different alliances uh, with different groups from civil society, helping governments, helping others who want to make a difference. And so I'm going to share a bit about the stuff that I've learned from that. And I've also been writing a book. So I've got a book that's coming out um, in September that's called How to Fight Inequality. So I'm going to share some of the lessons from that. But I wanted to start by talking a bit about COVID um, because COVID, you know, COVID has really wrecked um, so much in society, not just the, not just the virus, but more the fear the way it's closed down um, so many people's jobs, so many people's ability to um, to earn, the, the the stress that it's putting on people. So um, I wanted to talk about how this crisis of COVID, how that relates to the, the situation that we're all in of this unequal society. Um, is it making it better or worse? And then what does it mean for the future? What does it mean for... Um, are we going to get more more equal after this? Now, one of the strange things that that happened at the beginning with COVID, if you remember the names that started appearing in the newspaper, this person's got COVID, this person's got COVID, was that it was famous people, the rich and powerful. It was movie stars, it was political leaders, you know, and there's this idea, it seemed to be that we were all at risk. We were all in this. Uh, um, we were all suffering. Um, even the most powerful people were were at risk from this tiny, tiny virus. Um, but that perception, that idea that we were all equally going to be affected by this thing, that was wrong. You know, and one of the strange reasons why that happened at the beginning was because only the wealthy and well-connected could actually afford to get tested. So we only heard about about their their cases. But 
when they did have COVID, they were able to get the healthcare that they needed. They didn't have the underlying conditions that exposed them to risk. They didn't have to go to the most uh, dangerous jobs. They got to to work from home, or they even got to make even higher profits for their for their companies. So what we really learned was that, you know, COVID risk maps onto inequality, but also that COVID is not a great equalizer. COVID is an unequalizer, and it's unequalizing in health and it's unequalizing in in wealth. So COVID has made things worse. Things were bad, and COVID's made them worse in terms of that scale of just a few having so much and so many having so little. But that initial optimistic take that, you know, we'd get equalized, that was wrong. But now there's another uh, pessimistic take. And I say that pessimistic take is also wrong. The pessimistic take, and actually governments love to talk about this one. They say, because of COVID, there's no money. You know, the piggy bank is is empty. Uh, there's no resources. Our ability to do anything about our situation has gone. We're weak now. So don't ask for anything. Nothing's coming at the end of this crisis. You know, it's austerity. Things are going to be tough. There, there's no free money. But when you look at when have countries taken the boldest steps to tackle inequality? So we look at those times in history when different countries around the world, when did they do the most bold things to tackle inequality? Was it when the coffers were most full? Was it when things were most going right? Never. Never on those occasions. It was always and only when there was a crisis. They were in the middle of a crisis or they'd just come out of a crisis. So COVID has made things worse, but it's also shown how bad they are, shown how bad inequality is. So we've seen how, you know, the, the key workers, the health workers, the municipal workers, the people in the factories, they, without proper protection, hold society together, whilst elites look after themselves. Some of them have increased their wealth by hundreds of billions, right? These pandemic profiteers. So we've seen as well, it's, it's immoral and unsustainable when right to life is shaped by our bank balance. There's a, a beautiful um, song that says, if money was a thing, um, if living was a thing that money could buy, the rich would live and the poor would die. And, and that we've seen that in, in COVID, but that's also a truth, a deeper truth that's been exposed. So the acute crisis of the present moment reveals a deeper crisis of our age. And when we look at public opinion surveys from all across the world, and when we look at how media coverage is shifting, what we see is that a lot of inequality busting policies that previously people used to say that's too radical, that will never happen, that's crazy, don't even talk to me about that, is now mainstream, is now happening. So we've got a potential, we have an option. Now I'm not saying will, I'm not saying that the crisis will lead to action to tackle inequality. I'm only saying it's like a could. So if we think about power in society and social structure, it's like a hard metal. You know, you can't, you can't bend it. You can't do anything. When a crisis happens, it's like heat. It's like fire. And suddenly that metal is molten and you can bend it. But in which direction will it get bent? That depends on who pushes it and how hard and from what direction. It could get worse or it could get better. And if you're excited about the idea that we could emerge from this crisis with a more equal world. And then you're wondering, so who is it that can ensure that we do come out of this crisis in a more equal world? And I, I went and looked at, at the history of this, and here's the answer, you. So I've been putting together this book, How to Fight Inequality, coming out in September, and I looked at how progress has been made. And there's basically one big lesson. No one saves others. People standing together is how they liberate themselves. Now, it can be slow, it's always complicated, and sometimes it fails, but it's the only way it works. The structure doesn't ever change from the top. A group of young activists once said to me, there's no justice, there's just us. Now, that can sound a bit down, but actually just us is hugely powerful. So when we look at different times in history that people have really made a dent on inequality, there's three things that stand out that they got to do. The first is overcome deference. The second is build power together. And the third is create a new story. I'll talk about each of those now. So what do I mean by overcome deference? What I mean is that we're all brought up 
to be very respectful and obedient and to do what we're told. And we kind of think that people who don't do that are bad. But if you look at who are the heroes of the past that really made society fairer, all of those people were attacked for being too rebellious, for not obeying authority. So landless workers in Latin America who secured access to land, the civil rights movement in the US, the trade unionists who won the welfare state in Europe, those who struggled for independence for countries in Africa and Asia, they were all treated by the powerful as a threat to be squashed before they were recognized as people prompting needed change. Governments have never acted with the determination needed to tackle inequality without a push from the rest of us. There was a woman called Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. She worked in the movements of women's rights, civil rights, migrant rights, and the environment across the 20th century. And she was asked to sum up her key lesson. And she said, be a nuisance where it counts. So today's heroes are yesterday's troublemakers. Look, who's on the money? Who's on the stamps? Yesterday's troublemakers. And those who will define tomorrow are not those who the establishment is embracing today. The second thing is that collective power. So victories against inequality were always rooted in mass organizing. The change was always collective. It was never individual. So we're sometimes looking for the one big hero or the two or three heroes, and we tell stories like it was them. You might know the story about the Montgomery bus boycott. That's the folks in, in the US who refused to take the bus because they were saying that whites would sit in the front and blacks would sit in the back. And they organized a boycott and they beat it. And that's a famous story. People often tell it as the story where Rosa Parks one day decided to sit down and Martin Luther King decided to stand up and talk. But that's not how it worked. It was planned. It was trained for. Rosa Parks wasn't just tired. You know, and Dr. King said, I neither started the protest nor even suggested it. People just asked me to be their spokesperson. Two years before Rosa Parks got arrested for that boycott, the Women's Political Leadership Council was preparing for it. And it took more than a year after the boycott started for them to win. During that time, they had to print thousands of flyers to get the message out. This is 1960s, so hard to print thousands of flyers. You had to do it from those old machines. The churches had to serve as centers of organizing. People who didn't even use the bus had to help provide people with lifts. Postal service workers had to work out what the routes they're going to take. Taxi operators agreed to reduce rates. The organizers were, were threatened with legal challenges and they were also threatened with violent attacks. They held together faith groups, women's groups, labor unions and others under strain. Diane Nash, who was a civil rights leader, said it took many thousands of people to make the changes that were made people whose names we will never know. So if people want to make a change in tackling inequality, it's not gonna be one hero, it's gonna be thousands. Then the last point is that what we find when we look at how a difference is made is how important stories are, how important it is to paint a picture of a more equal world. So in Britain, for example, in the early 20th century, Sylvia Pankhurst, who was a suffragette and a, and a fighter for women's rights and for workers' rights, made these beautiful paintings and beautiful pottery so that people would understand their situation. In the 1940s, the Archbishop of Canterbury, he was the one that came up with the phrase welfare state. And when we look at what happened in African and Asian countries after independence, we saw that the narrative of independence was never just about replacing one set of leaders with another. It was always about achieving greater equality as core to honoring those who've made a sacrifice and core to the national destiny. So citizens in newly independent countries were clear that the role of new governments just was to reshape society by tackling inequality. Now, later on, 1980s comes along this idea, structural adjustment. And with that idea, elites started to take out from people's history the, this story of nationhood and try to separate it from this struggle against inequality. We need to reclaim that story and that story never just comes from policy papers and reports and 10 point plans it happens from from music and art and poetry it comes from preaching not just teaching and sometimes progressive people we we're so into the numbers and data and science and being right that's important it's not how change happens if we leave it to the other side to have the stories and the passion They'll win and we'll lose.
So we need to rediscover that that capability for for telling stories, which is why I'm I'm so pleased to be here with you, Pilato, as a musician who shows just how powerful music is. So when we look back at how did people do it before? You know, if we want to beat inequality now, let's look at how they did it before. And when we look back, we find it was never given and it never just happened. It was never just caused by a crisis or caused by a situation or caused by what had just happened. No, it was always ordinary people were challenging, ordinary people organized, and ordinary people painted a picture of the world that could be. A COVID has exacerbated that feeling that we can often have, that we're not in control of events, that things just go on all around us. They just happen to us, that we're just the objects, never the subjects. But when we look back at history, we see that sometimes crises like this can be our moment. They never give it to us, but we can seize that moment. We can never seize it alone, but we can seize it together. If we seize it together, we can shape what happens with each other. We can make our own history. Thank you, Ben. Uh, so uh, I'm talking to Ben Phillips. Uh, ben Phillips has been an international inequality, anti-inequality campaigner for, for some years now and has worked in uh, 14 countries, 14 cities, and uh, uh, is joining me today to discuss COVID-19 and vis-a-vis -vis, uh, inequality challenges. So now, Ben, when you say COVID-19 is not uh, equalized us, most of my people in Zambia would disagree with you. Uh, they would disagree because we have, for the first time, seen our rich people, our political leaders, our political leaders uh, not flying out of the country going for treatment. So now when they are sick, they go to the same hospitals that we go to. They are treated by the same doctors that they refuse to pay properly. They go to the hospitals that they are not properly funded. How do you, how does that not equalize us? That's, that's, a, that's a great, and that's very powerful um, for a country to, to do that, to limit its elite in that, in that way. Um, but they're still, they're still having a much, much easier life than the average person. So they are able to keep themselves safe. So people say, for example, socially distance, socially distance. How do you socially distance if you work in a meat packing factory? How do you, how do you socially distance if you're in a, in a warehouse? How do you socially distance if you live in a slum? You can't. Those guys can. Those guys in, in, in villas can. One of the things that we know as well with COVID is you're much more likely to, to, to suffer if you do get COVID. You're much more likely to suffer if you're if you're unwell physically, if you have a pre-existing uh, medical issue, now you're much more likely to have one of those if you are not the richest people, and they can always find a way to make sure they're the first to get tested, they're the first to jump any queue, they're the first to get help. So they'll tell a story that you know they're just as much at risk as everyone else, and actually COVID does teach us about our interdependence. That's true that we do need each other. But what's not true is that they've had as tough a time as you. The other thing that's happened is their stocks, their investments have gone up. So the, the money that they've got on international stock markets, that they're, they, they're richer now than they were at the beginning of this, of this crisis. Whereas the average person, the average person who doesn't have a formal job, um, who's, who if they don't work that day, they don't get paid, that person has lost days and days and days of work and ability to earn, or they've had to defy police and defy rules in order to go out to work and then be at risk of being beaten up. So the, there, there are discrepancies in the experience. We see this as well in how lockdowns enforce and all of that. So um, these guys will tell you, these people at the top will tell you, we're suffering just as much as you. No, what they might be experiencing is for the first time ever, right? They're not completely immune from suffering a little bit. And for people who've been in a bubble of privilege, a little scratch in that bubble, you know, the amount of tears that will flow will, will, will flood, right? But for those who have suffered much more in the past, 
will, from COVID, experience much worse things. And it's not just about the medical issue. It's much, much more suffering from COVID rather than people catching COVID. Much more suffering from COVID is happening in the way it's destroying people's ability to earn a living. And for the rich, that's not an issue. But for ordinary people, that is exactly what they're going through. Hunger is like through the roof. Um, highest it's been in decades. Ben, uh, so you, you've advised governments on, in, on, on inequality. And mm. uh, I want you to imagine that I have a government. Mm. How would you, how, what would you say to me for me to balance the the during this COVID-19, the economics and the health of a nation. I'll give you a situation where I, I'm, a, I'm a president and then I have about 10 billion kwacha, which I need to give as stimulus package to, to the people of my, my country. Who do I give it to? I give it to the businesses, the companies that these people have been going to, because I'm thinking if these people are not are not operating, it means that tomorrow there won't be jobs for my people. Do I give it to uh, the people on the streets who may just uh, use it today and may not make profit tomorrow? Who, what would you advise me as a president of, of my country? And how do I strike the balance between what is uh, economically viable and what is healthy uh, for the health of uh, so the country. firstly you want to get it as close to the people as possible and what we've seen in a lot of countries where money has been handed over to big business is that it hasn't in the long run saved jobs because it hasn't been tied enough to actually getting money in the hands of ordinary people so as much as possible you don't want to be handing over money to big corporations and and asking them politely, can you please save everyone's jobs? They find a way around that. So it's much better off trying to find a way to put money in the hands of ordinary people. For example, right now in this situation through a universal basic income, that means you give cash to, to everybody, or we you increase the cash you give to pensioners or increase the cash you give to, to kids, to everyone's kids, but you, you just wanna get money to people because also, they spend that. If you get money in the hands of ordinary people, they spend that money and they spend it locally. So you would then enable people to, to resurrect the local small businesses. The guy who's running a motorbike repair shop or a hairdresser or a cafe, they get resurrected when you put money in the hands of ordinary people. Whereas when you hand it over to some big mining company, that the, the return on investment in terms of jobs is gonna be really, really uh, uh, small. The second thing I would say, sometimes they feel like they're balancing health and wealth but those things are not actually they're not really in contention because unless we can beat covid and beat this this problem then the, we don't we don't have economies so when you say sometimes governments say i can't afford to have everyone get free health care you know it's too expensive so what do they mean they want people going around being sick being infectious that that's expensive much cheaper to get people free healthcare, and make sure that they're taken care of, than to have infectious people going around saying, I can't afford to get better, so I'm just gonna go around you know, as a danger to everybody else. The third thing is that with all of these spending choices, you know, the most mad spending is how much people are paying back in debt. A lot of countries are paying more in servicing debt than they are on health, education, and all forms of social protections, that's pensions, child benefits, everything. There should be an absolute hold. There shouldn't be a penny going out in debt payment from any developing country this year. Shouldn't happen, shouldn't happen this year, shouldn't happen next year. And then we need a serious conversation about how we solve that, that debt crisis. But right now, just stop paying and, and fight for that because it's, it's, money is basically being taken out the hands, right? Taken out the, of the hospitals, taken out of the, of the schools, and it's being handed over to financiers in the in the West, I mean that's that's sick. Um, so that is the, the 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 biggest, most wasteful, most wrong spending that developing countries are doing is how much they're handing back in in unfair debt payments. So uh, I want you again. I want you again to imagine my country. Mm. Uh, imagine I'm the president for this uh, this country and. Right. 
Uh, I decide to structure my response to COVID-19 uh, mm -hmm. in segments. So I have the VIP section. So if if uh, a minister falls sick, if they've got a VIP section where they, ra they are rushed to, and then I have the ordinary where every other citizen goes to, is that is that helpful? Is that the best uh, approach to a crisis like COVID-19? That is how you get a bad health service and a bad education. So there's a brilliant phrase, it's really true. They say, when you have a system for the poor, you have a poor system. That's why if you wanna have a really good healthcare system, really good education system, you want everybody in it, including the, the, the middle class and the elite kids. If you look at countries like Germany, or the Netherlands or the Scandinavian countries, the wealthy use public health care, public transport, public education, and they're all good. And if as soon as they start to opt out of the system, as soon as they have a route out, then those systems end up no good. So you mentioned, for example, that you know, healthcare system have been languishing because when someone gets sick, an African leader gets sick, they they fly off to Dubai or they fly off to 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 Europe or, or to the Far East. Now, but we need to take away that option locally too. And if if their kids are going to government schools, if they are using government buses, if when they get sick they rely on government healthcare, the quality you will find they suddenly work out a way to make it work. The reason they don't make it work is because it's for you. But once it's for them, they'll make it work. So all societies that have built quality services have done it by universal services. Where there's an opt-out, where we say this is for poor people, it always ends up shit. Thank you very much, man. Uh, so there's a, there's a, there's a, a contribution from Nalikando Elvis Sinyama. It says, hand money in the hands of ordinary people being affected, yet our government can't even locate and sustain licensed SMEs. Uh, there is a, this is a, obviously relating to that question I asked where mm. the government uh, has about 10 million, 10 billion uh, quarter and they give it to banks mm. and street vendors no access to mm. that money. Mm. And a street vendor for for him or her to survive, they'll have to sell every single day. Yes, for them to survive. So how do they how do they survive in a situation where they will have to compete with uh, a big uh, company, a big business uh, guy, and their business is usually not registered? Yeah, and and that's. It's so hard for people, and this is what we were talking about, about, you know, this crisis. You don't have to get COVID to die from the COVID crisis. In fact, most people who die from the COVID crisis won't die from COVID. They'll die from, from, from hunger or they'll die from sickness caused by poverty and, 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 and hunger and from being in, in cramped conditions. But the, this question about, about SMEs, you know, one part of the answer is that government needs to get better at supporting small and medium scale enterprises. You're absolutely right. And they need to work out a way to do that um, uh, directly. What are the different ways in which they can help um, local and small businesses? Because local and small businesses generate a lot more and help a local economy a lot more than depending on, on, on big business. If you look at jobs per the amount of dollars invested, you get much more jobs from uh, uh, small and medium enterprises than you get from some of these big, big firms. But that's also hard to do. As you said, it's hard to identify. Where are these small entrepreneurs? All of that's really hard to do. But one thing that isn't hard to do is to get cash to everybody. Now, some countries already have systems of pensions for the elderly, or they already have systems of child benefit for, for small kids, for parents of small kids. And some have systems of, of some kind of universal support for people. Now, if you ramp up those, um, those things, then you're doing two things. One is you're helping people immediately right now in a crisis where it's hard to get work. The second is you are putting money into the customers of the small and medium enterprises. 
because the rich people don't go to the guy who has a barber shop on the street that works from one solar light. They don't go to him, right? They're in the shopping mall, right? Paying money to, not even to the shop in the shopping mall, paying money to the company that owns the building that the shopping mall the, uh, um, um, hairdresser will, will rent. When you put money in the in the hands of ordinary people, that's the that's the customers for the SMEs. That's the guys in which people are going to buy motorbikes from. That's the guys in which people are going to buy a cup of tea from the tea store from. So if you get money on their hands, it's not just a, a welfare measure. You're boosting small and medium enterprises because you're putting money in the hands of their customers. It will it will get back. It will circulate in the system, um, which is why what seems like a really obvious and simple solution, you know. Politicians hate simple solutions. You say give money to everybody. They're like, no, no, I, I need it. it needs to be more complicated. You know, but giving money to everyone works. They've just done a year-long experiment in Finland and they found it worked. And and we we've seen at a smaller scale where where cash has been put in people's hands, they, they spend it and they spend it well. Rich people are like, oh, you give money to poor people and they'll spend it all on booze. But the amount of money, the, the percentage of people's income that's spent on alcohol and entertainment and stupid things is much higher amongst middle class people and even higher amongst rich people. Overwhelmingly, people who don't have much spend money on food, on rent, and on their kids. So you can trust them. So there's another one. Uh, this is coming from Nika D. Tapiwa. Ben, no. what, what could be the dangers of having a person who is politically inclined to one political party as a governor of a central bank in a, a, central bank in a country? Sure. <laughs> it's not great. It's not a great idea. But um, I think there's a, there's a, it's not a great idea because your, your financial, your, your, your policy of your, of your country, uh, your economic policy shouldn't be um, uh, partisan in, in that way. But I would also say, because right now people are saying, oh, you know, central bank uh, independence and, and old, old school monetary policy and they, um, any alternative to it is just seen as 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 corrupt and and dangerous and and not taking economics seriously. Now, just sacking someone one day and replacing them with 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 someone else for whatever political reason is not not a way to go. But we also need to criticise and challenge the way in which mainstream respectable tie wearing finance works. Right, so. Um, uh, the 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 normal way in which central banks have been operating, in which they're not prioritizing jobs, they're prioritizing uh, inflation reduction, uh, sometimes uh, excessively, creates a situation in which millions of people can't find work. So we need to have good independent institutions of all parts of the state, whether that's the judiciary, finance, all parts of the state, good highly qualified technical people but at the same time we also need to mandate them with a charge that says you know a successful economy is one in which people are, are better off you know zambia you used to be a low income country right you're now a middle income country now when you went from a low income country to a middle income country the number of poor people increased yeah you went from a low income country to a middle income country the number of poor people increased so what was happening? What was happening? You know, there was this phrase, Africa rising, right? And right now, activists say it's not about Africa rising, but Africans rising. So it's not enough just to say what's the growth rate of Zambia or what's the growth rate of any other country. You have to be looking at what's the, what's the life for, for, for people? What's happening to, to, to ordinary people's lives? How many people are, are getting above $5 a day or, or, or $10 a day? That's what matters. So I would say in, in finance and economic policy, you're right. What's happened with the, with the central bank was, was weird. But don't romanticize how things were. You know, there's this idea that we want to get back to normal, but normal wasn't very good. You know, and, and um, uh, sometimes you can look at particular leaders and you can think they created the crisis, but often actually the crisis created them. So. Mm when we look at how you build a, 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 a fair and more equal society um we need to look not just at how we deal with immediate um uh, issues but how you build a society where everybody has a has a stake and everybody has a a job that pays 
Uh, so uh, I want to get this one. This one is coming from Jambi who uh, Jambi who says, I like saying of creating systems for the poor. We have seen now our education system has now been messed. Ben, comment mm. on the aspect of private education system versus public uh, education system. So there have been studies of like when has a country moved from uh, to a place where everyone completes secondary school? Yeah, it's one way of judging it. Or when has a country moved to a situation where all adults are literate or everybody reaching the age of 18 or young adult, all that cohort are literate? So that's a way of, of saying, of investigating what is a successful school system, right? So there have been loads of studies on this. Now, in every single one, they found that what enabled that was massive expansion and investment in the public system. So when they asked the question, where has boosting private education enabled us to get to a situation where everyone can read or where everyone finished secondary school, and you ask people to name the country, right? Any time in history, any part of the world, name the country where boosting private education got them to universal literacy or universal secondary completion. And the answer to that is nowhere. Never in any part of history, in any time, anywhere in the world, has boosting the private system been an answer. So now a lot of people say, oh, but the, the government system's no good, you know? I, I, I tried to send my kids to the government school and they weren't, and they weren't any good. I, I, I understand why people say that, but the answer for a country can't be that because what the private system does is it extracts um, uh, a small number and maybe that number gets bigger, but it basically takes people out of the system and maintains a system in which there's no, there's no charge on the state to provide a good quality education for everybody. The, the second thing it does is it separates people culturally. So you'll all say, people say, you know, I'm a, I'm, I'm a Zambian, right? Or people in Kenya will say, I'm a, I'm a Kenyan. What do you do together? You know, in, in Sweden or Germany or um, the Netherlands, and also I would say in Ghana in the 1950s and 60s or in Zambia, right? In early independent Zambia, people went to school together. They used the bus together. They went to hospital together. They they, they 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 were together. If you're just in the same country as someone, but they're you know you're, you're you're living these parallel lives where people never meet unless someone goes to work as someone else's gardener. That's not a nation. So if if you want universal education, you have to invest in the public system. You have to make it work. You have to pay teachers properly. You have to get the classes to be small enough. You have to invest in it like it like it matters. Um, which Zambia did in its early early days. So you know how to do this um but private isn't an answer private healthcare private education they're not an answer to making a society work they they don't work on their own terms but they also they're breaking people up into into constituents parts and stopping you from being a nation ben uh the very structure of uh, the economic systems mm. is an the the, how do we how do we get justice? How do we get economic justice when the very structure of economics, world economics, is an ego? The people yeah. that have too much depend on those that do not have much. The so, educated the educated people de, uh, depend on the less educated for affordable labor. Yeah. How do we how do we bring equality in a yeah. system that is an ego? So I think the first thing is that we shouldn't move like there was a there's sometimes a time when we're really naive, right? Where we think that everything is is fine. And then we have a moment of awakening where we realize that things are not fine. But there's a dangerous point there because that awakening where you realize things are not fine can also make people cynical and fatalistic and nihilistic and negative. And they start to say, oh, nothing can change, right? But if you say nothing can change, then you change nothing. Things can change. So there have been, and this is what I looked at in my book, you know, there have been moments in, in, in history in different parts of the world where countries went from being really unequal to being much more equal. You can do it. But what the, the only way that that's done is 
people get together and they they organize and they 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 fight for it. And when I say fight, I don't mean fight. I mean they organize and they <laughs> they 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 find power. Now let's take something like if international level, right? So copper in 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 Zambia. Sometimes people in Zambia will be like, oh well, we have to let these guys exploit us because otherwise they'll go somewhere else. But there's not that many countries that produce copper and people need it. So if 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 Zambia was able to 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 plan and organize with other countries and they could start to demand a decent price. So that's one part of it. And then the second part is how do you then ensure that the profits from that go to the go to the people of the country? It's not you know, the fact that there's that there's that there's wealth in the in the ground, you know, it's not talent to take that wealth. That wealth belongs to everybody. It's not like a, a, a discovery. It's just a monopoly that someone's claimed, right? Cecil Rhodes used to do it, and now there's these new Cecil Rhodeses, okay, that are appearing. They're just as bad, okay. New outfits, just the same as the old old guy. But um, you need to look at how that's how that's distributed, and then make sure it gets drawn. And people make sure it gets spent on good things. But it's totally possible, right? And so what people shouldn't do is they shouldn't get so down. So now that we see that things are not fair, that the game is rigged, that doesn't mean it's it doesn't mean you can't start to fix it or at least start to you know tip the balance back towards you know people it's been done and it and it can be done so it's really important that we don't move from naivety to kind of rage and despair um elites would love people to be in despair right the mm -hmm. the people in despair are as manipulatable as um as naive people right but but so keep hope really really important it, unless you have hope you never ever bring bring change, but not hope in some abstract thing that someone's going to come along and save you. Hope based on respect and love and belief in each other. So I'm going to follow that up later. Let me just uh, let's mm. see if we can respond to this. Then we and I can follow that uh, talk on copper and and, yeah. and pricing and all that. So Kelvin Kasanda Banda says, Ben, having a government that works in a similar system, you have stayed on. What would you do as a youth to correct the situation if you had the power to do so? Yeah. But take in mind that your government doesn't allow you to speak on certain matters as a youth. What yeah. would you do back up plan? Okay, so um, they don't. But um, let's look at where where change has happened, right? Change has never happened, never been delivered by people who ask permission. Yeah, that, that of course... So um, now, you know, sometimes when we look back at history, we think, oh, these people have always been accepted, right? Martin Luther King, there was an opinion poll in the 1960s, and overwhelmingly, the people who answered that opinion poll said they, they didn't like him. They thought he was too extreme, yeah? Mm. So these, the, if, you, if you're not willing to be challenged, to be um, pushed back, of course, you're not going to achieve achieve change. So when you said, you know, you don't have power, you do have power. You don't have power individually, but you do have power with others. And you can't just like rush into it crazy, right? One of my friends, um, a guy called um, uh, Mohammed Lamin Saidi Khan, he helped to bring about the change in, in Gambia. They had a dictator who was there for his entire life. And then um, they got rid of him with this campaign called Gambia Has Decided. Right, that what happened was dictator had lost the election and then just stayed in. Now, what, what Mohammed Lamin Sadi Khan said to me was, if we'd sent hundreds of people in the square, of course we would have lost. But when we send thousands of people in, that's when we start to win. So one of the things in terms of power is you need numbers. It's not about five or ten like heroes, right? Don't think that what you're giving is your life. Yeah, Kumi Naidu said this to me, who was a South African who he's, he's run Greenpeace, he's run Amnesty, he was a fighter against apartheid. His friend, him and his friend were having a, an argument one day and his friend said to him, are you willing to give it all? And Kumi said, yeah, I'm willing to give my life. And he said, no, 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 don't be willing to give your life. Be willing to give the rest of your life. Yeah, so this isn't about one one heroic moment. This is about a lifetime of, of patient organizing. But But you absolutely do have power. And the, the people in history who brought change have overwhelmingly been young, overwhelmingly mm. been young people, often students or people who've just finished being students. And um, they are the people that bring change. You are the people that bring change. But the trick is, is to do it together because alone you're weak, but together you're, you're powerful. Uh, McDonald Nyaga 
Mm. Yeah, Maya asks, Zambia's manufacturing capacity is close to non-existent. And most of these SMEs, for example, those dealing in clothing, electronics, and among other ventures, depend on imports to bring these goods in. And imports have become costly exchange rates. Mm. Lengthy cross-border restrictions, EDC. How can we realistically guarantee the growth of SMEs in such a period provided? Yeah, you know, the, 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 the economics that came in with structural adjustment where in the 1980s, the World Bank and the IMF were telling countries like Zambia, you know, uh, don't protect anything, open up, um, uh, you know, global competition. No country has ever developed in that way. You know, it was a, a recipe that they prescribed to you, but they never applied in their own, in their own countries. And, um, being able to develop, you know, local industry, especially small scale for, you know, small scale producers is something, it's a, it's a function of government, you know, to, to do that, to enable it. And it's good economics, but everybody got these scholarships to, um, the US and they were taught that that's madness and they went back with the new religion. You know, but what's funny is, right, the IMF and the World Bank doesn't teach that anymore, but local elites often still think that. And I, I often say it's as if, you know, the bishop has started teaching something new, but the local priests haven't haven't learned. So um, uh, what you need is a new, econ is a different economic policy. Um, the, when you say they've got no ma manufacturing capacity, it's true, but that doesn't mean that Zambians don't have the capability. They absolutely do, but they need to be given a break and they need to be given help and not just exposed to to, to cheap and subsidized imports from other, other places, but there needs to be serious investment. I think that um, for too long, um, there was an assumption that certain sectors of the economy would deliver you know, mining or whoever, and it doesn't work. Um, or people got very excited about finance or high tech things, and they didn't take seriously and invest in these small scale, unsexy businesses run by the, the, the little guy. But that is actually how you power an economy with jobs that works for everybody. So you need an, an, a new economic policy. But the way you'll get a new economic policy is by organizing, because the, the government are not going to give it to you unless they they see that you're a voice that they can't ignore and i don't make that as a comment about one particular government that's a that's a truth uh martin hamamba says in this world we need people to be in no stages of life mm. equality only equals giving every person share according to their efforts on what they are doing if four spoons became folks the world system won't work let the world system drop Eco shares at every stage of society. What's your what's your uh, reaction to them? Sure. I mean, I think sometimes people think that if you start talking about equality, what you mean is you know some people are going to be lazy. You know, you're not going to get industry. You're not going to get you know successful economies. The 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 Scandinavian economies do better than the U.S. economies. They share more, and they're actually more successful, more entrepreneurial. It's really hard to be entrepreneurial when you're scared that you won't have enough to eat, or when you're scared that if you get sick, you know, unless you store some money away, if you get sick, you'll die. If you if you know that if you get sick, you'll be taken care of, and that your kids can go to a school that you don't need to find the fees for, and that there'll be buses that are safe and cheap that you can take to work, and that when you're at work, you'll get a decent salary, then in those kind of conditions, people have actually higher uh capability to be entrepreneurial so um a fairer society is not about you know free cake for everybody it's about um everybody being able to share in in the wealth that they are creating so it means higher wages and then it also means enabling the next generation to have an equal shot with good schools and it also means keeping us all safe and all safe from the fear that comes from um, what happens if we get sick? We need to take away that that fear from people. Uh, Mukuka Hagen is asking, what is the role of academics in fighting inequality? Do you think they are doing enough? Uh, no, they're not doing enough. But I also think they need to be humble. So, so you know, sometimes academics are like, oh, I'm neutral. I'm neutral, right? So that means that 
you, you kind of imagine, you know, the academic that says, I'm neutral, I don't take a view, I'm not biased, and they're very proud of themselves. It's like, if you're walking across a bridge and you see a child drowning, you know, would they be like, fascinating, let me observe and see how long it takes before the child sinks. No, they jump in, you know, and they they need to, we're all moral human beings, ultimately, right? So, mm-hmm. if, you know, I'd never understood this idea that to be a good academic as an academic doesn't care about goodness. It doesn't make sense to me. You know, if, if people understand they're experts in the tools of economics or political science, put them in the service of, of, of people's well-being. That doesn't mean you have to be on one political party or another or doesn't mean manipulate evidence, but put it at the service of, of good. So I'd like to see, you know, academics and policy experts and, and people that, that in that world um, put more skin in the, in the game. But then the thing I was saying about humility, that sometimes people think, you know, if there's someone to lead a process, it needs to be the person with the best degree. It needs to be the person that's read the most books, you know, but actually change is powered by um, popular culture. So people who are able to uh, communicate in effective ways um, with ordinary people, people who can express these ideas, not in articles, but in songs and in in paintings and in slogans, they're so important. That's the, that's the, the foundation of a successful movement. So I, I think academics need to join in more, but also academics can't be arrogant. They can't assume that they are the people who know. And they also have to understand that the biggest experts on all of this are people at the sharpest end. And then learn to learn to learn, and not just to teach. Uh, so I want to get back to the issue of copa that you had mentioned. Mm. And so we had our structural adjustments. I think it should be in somewhere in the nineties, in in mm. the early nineties in Zambia. And what that in, uh, inter- uh, meant was uh, we, the government, had to sell. Uh, sell its assets, sell its businesses into mm-hmm. private hands. And that did not happen because the people of Zambia decided, not mm-hmm. because the government of Zambia decided. That was on recommendation by the World Bank and the IMF. Mm-hmm. Uh, today, we do not have uh, control over the mines. Mm-hmm. And what happened? So we have even I think we were together in Mufurila, you mm. understand mm. the situation. How then do we, do the people of Zambia claim power over the resources that they, they have in their own country? How, how do they get control when the world market the international community, the World Bank, the IMF, dictated what should happen to the resources that are owned by the Zambian people. Yeah. So um, it did. What hasn't stopped is it hasn't stopped being Zambian's country. So you're right that these these mechanisms have taken power and control away from ordinary Zambians into the hands of foreigners, often in collaboration with a very small group of Zambians. Uh, who were involved in a kind of co-exploitation of of the rest of the of the country? Now, but what hasn't ha- what hasn't happened? It hasn't become impossible for Zambia to do it. Ultimately, all these things are a political choice. So, if someone tells you that technically it's impossible, it's not true. And Western governments, when they face this type of challenge, they they the, the rule book is thrown away, and and they make a decision that fits their nation. Now, in Bolivia. They had um, uh, big natural gas um, uh, exports. And one day they decided they were going to double what they were charging companies to get hold of this gas. And all of the companies said, we'll leave. They all said, we'll leave. And none of them left. They doubled it anyway. They, they spoke to, to Norway and they, Norway said, no, it's fine. Just, just do it. You know, people will pay. They want this stuff. And they invested that money in, in kids' education. Um, so. It is possible. I think the, 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 the first thing is that uh, people need to recognize that these things are, are not technically impossible. They're hard, but they're not technically impossible. And if you have the will, 
you can find a mechanism. So if someone's telling you, unfortunately, because of deals that we made 20 years ago, it's no longer possible to do this. We have to suffer in perpetuity. It's not true. You're ultimately a democracy. You're sovereign. You can make decisions in the national interests for your country. But then in order for that to happen, leaders need to feel under pressure from you. They feel under enormous pressure from the mining corporations, from foreign countries, from international multilaterals. They feel under enormous pressure from them and very little from you. So if they if they feel under pressure from you for that kind of action, they'll start to take steps that resemble the steps that we're that we're talking about. But um, you got absolutely shafted on all of those things. You're completely right. But it's not you can't just mourn. You can't just be like, oh, well, isn't it sad that we lost the window of opportunity? The window of opportunity is now. You know, the world is in in this COVID crisis. Every single rule has been thrown out the window. So now is the time to make a, a new set of rules. Um, and then the question is, who gets to make the rules? And, and how do you get to be the people that shape who makes those rules? This one is coming from Misozi Tembo. Misozi yeah. says, how should Zambians position themselves to demand for a safe and effective COVID-19 vaccine, the people's vaccine? Yeah. What should yeah, about, uh, yeah. You know. I'm involved in this campaign for the people's vaccine and, and there's two parts to it. So one part of it is that um, every national government should pledge that they will give this vaccine to everybody in the country for free. They're not going to try and make money out of it. They're not going to try and get money back. It doesn't make sense to disincentivize anybody because the way the vaccine works is you want everybody to take it in order for it to work. You need everybody or, or most people to take it in order for it to work. So that's the first thing. Governments need to say we're going to we're going to give it free to everybody. The second thing, though, is we need to make sure enough doses are going to be made. And at the moment, I'm worried. And, and here's why. So at the moment, individual companies that look likely to find uh, a vaccine, they are going to own the the recipe and they want to hold that recipe. So they want to be the only person manufacturing that. And they can't manufacture at the scale that's needed. They can't manufacture enough. So they're going to manufacture a limited supply. And then rich countries are going to get the bulk of that supply. And then developing countries are going to get a much smaller number of doses. Much smaller. They'll get some, but much smaller. So people in developing countries will be left waiting and waiting and waiting, whilst people in rich countries are getting healthy. Now, Sometimes it can seem like it's just a, um, uh, a battle between the people in the rich countries and the people in the poor countries about who can get more when. And the people in rich countries will always win that battle. But it isn't just about that. There's another battle, which is that these guys that say, oh, the total number we can produce is this much. They're creating that restriction because if they share how to make the vaccine, so then companies around the world can can make the vaccine, we could have companies in, in Zambia or in South Africa or in Egypt or in Nigeria making the vaccine, then mm. we can make enough that everyone has to have it. So it's not just about who's first in the queue. Let's get rid of the queue. Now, with AIDS, this did not happen. So in with AIDS, around about 1996, 97, they knew how to save people's lives and they started to save people's lives in the West. And people in Africa were left to die, not because they didn't know how, and not because there wasn't enough, because other companies were saying we can make it. You know, Indian companies were saying we can make this $50. But the Western companies were like, no, don't make it. Don't make it. We want only us to make it. And we want to charge a large amount. And when Mandela tried to get it to his people in South Africa, they, they took him to court. Yeah, he'd been in court in the Ravonia trial, standing up against apartheid. And these guys, these Western drug companies, they put Mandela in court again. Again, uh, saying we accuse you of trying to do too much to help your people. Now, we can't rely on the generosities of these drugs companies. So what we need to do is we need to put pressure on them that they have to share. They have to mm. share how to make it. So what, what wealthy countries should do that are cutting deals with these um, drugs companies is to say, you're getting public money for research and development, public money for purchasing these doses, public money for in all sorts of ways. For that public investment, we demand that you share how this is made, share the technical knowledge and know-how with other countries with other other companies through the World Health Organization. That's what they need to insist. And Zambians should be pressing their government to be part of this campaign and, and to put pressure and to say, we insist, we demand that the West shares this. Otherwise, a, a, a virus that wasn't 
you know, didn't originate in, in Africa and largely reached Africa through the West, um, will have people um, uh, still getting sick and will have economies still shut down and we'll have people still going hungry when we know how to fix it just because some pharmaceutical shareholders want to make a, a, a bit more cash. They've got enough. They can settle down and um, remember that life is more sacred than, than money. Uh, so there's a follow-up question to that. It's coming from Elisha Musolokoto. But is there any vaccinations which had been approved, which have been approved by World Health Organization? Not yet. Not yet. But um, the experts believe that either in 2020 or in 2021, um, things will be found. And rich countries are already making deals with some of these um, vaccines to buy up the whole supply that that company can make, leaving just a few. And what they sometimes say is, oh, no, I'm, I'm caring because, you know, I've also purchased... Um, some doses that I'm going to give to developing countries through this, you know, charity type of gift. But we're saying it's not about, you know, giving some doses. It's about sharing the how to make the vaccine. Um, so not yet, but that moment is is coming. And, and we need to make sure that we uh, internationally agree that it will be shared before the vaccine is found. Otherwise, we'll be doing catch up. We'll be doing what happened with 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 AIDS. We'll be going to funerals um when we when we should be going you know to hospitals or to birthday parties so ben i think we've come to the 60th uh, minute i'll ask you to close uh your discussion and this program with uh what's your call to action so people that have been listening mm. what is it that uh, you leave them to do and uh obviously i'll let you talk briefly about your book because i'm in the book i featured mm. in your book so I'll let you talk about the book and uh, yes, so you can pick it. Great. So what I talk about in the book, How to Fight Inequality, is the, is the how. And I look at history. I look at where in different countries, in different places, people have done it and where now people are starting to organize again. So the first the first big call to action is to, is to believe in your own ability to change, because that is the only way in which things have changed you know, anywhere ever. So this history of one individual big hero or Superman, it's not true. You know, that's not how it happened. It happened from ordinary people organizing together. So believe in your in yourself because that it is possible to bring change. Now, how? How to bring change? Firstly, be happy to not be deferential. Be happy to be seen as a troublemaker, as a as a as a rebel, as a difficult person. Because if the establishment are hugging you now, you're not creating the future of tomorrow. Right. So if they if they like you, you're doing something wrong. OK. Secondly, don't think you can do it on your own. Don't look for some romantic exit where it's just you, you know, and a few mates and you're getting into big trouble. Um, build power uh, horizontally by getting lots and lots of people involved. Tell a friend, tell a friend, tell a friend. Build power. Thirdly, don't just be in this space. And I get in this space myself sometimes of talking about policies, talking really technical. You know, remember that that change is about people's hearts, not just their heads. So write songs and sing songs and write slogans and and draw pictures and create art and and tell a beautiful story. You know, don't just be stuck on the numbers. Give people a dream. Give people a reason to believe and mm. and build that power. But ultimately, you know, I want to be on a on another program in the future where I'm interviewing you you know, and you're telling me how you did it, because it absolutely can be done. So let's book a moment, five years time, I interview you, and you tell me how it happened. I'm really looking forward to following your journey and what you're going to do, and how you're going to make your country great, and how you're going to make the world a fair and more equal place. Thank you. Uh, are you going to tell us about your book? Because I'm about to flash the... Sure. Flash... So yeah, sure. it's what called How to Fight Inequality. It's yeah. 150 pages only. It's a DIY guide to people who want to make a difference. Um, so um, it's coming out in September. Um, so look out for it in, in bookshops or online. Um, uh, look out for it. And featured in the book, amongst other people, uh, is Pilato. So you know you'll enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, so that's, uh, let me see if I can flash the book. I can get the are. book. Yeah. 
let me try this technology stuff. Yeah, so that's a book there. That's uh, it's how to fight inequality and why that fight needs you by Ben Phillips. So uh, you're gonna go look for this book and uh, yep. Uh, thank you very much. The troublemakers in your life. <laughs> The troublemakers. Thank you very much, Ben, for creating time. And obviously, you will be, uh, I'll be calling on you uh, for future programs. The idea is that uh, uh, inequality as a term has been so academic. It's been, uh, it's, it's an abstract uh, term for so many of our people. And I did an album that discusses a lot of scenarios that we've uh, physically and, and, and experienced as a people. And the theme is inequality, but then this program is brought, uh, is created in, to create and amplify the attention that we give to these issues. And obviously, uh, see if we can mobilize the grassroots, mobilize the people to creating a society that is equal at all levels. And thank you very much for creating time. And obviously, I'll be calling on you for other stuff, for other topics to discuss. And thank hopefully, you. You're going to win. You're going to win. We shall win. <laughs> thank you very much, Ben. And thank you very much for everybody that tuned in. See you on, what's today? Today is Monday. See you on Friday. Take care.